Hi, welcome to Just Jesus. This is lesson 35. And this today is a lesson that's going to bless us, it's going to encourage us, and it's going to really show you how much the Trinity is involved in you being a Christian. So today's lesson is lesson 35, and it's called United with the Trinity. United with the Trinity. But before we start, let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray right now that you would give us a distinct revelation of the powerful truth that we are united with the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember, if you've got your notes, that's brilliant. Follow with me. Answer the questions at the end. Don't forget to write down five bullet points that or up to five bullet points that really touch your heart because the Holy Spirit is trying to talk to you through these lessons and cause you to believe it, cause you to apply it, cause you to think on it. And uh, so write down them bullet points as they stick into your heart. That's the Holy Spirit really bringing the word to your attention. And so let's just carry on now and be blessed together. Praise the Lord. So, united with the Trinity... And this is the introduction. Let's read together. When you became a Christian, a whole new life started. You were united to the triune God forever. Let's read that again. When you became a Christian, a whole new life started. You were united to the triune God forever. Praise the Lord. And notice I always say forever because it's true. Because you have eternal life. This is something that's lasting forever, praise the Lord. And so we are united to the Trinity. And when we say the Trinity, we're talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And because we're in Christ, because just Jesus is true, because in him we dwell and he dwells in us, because of how united we are with God the Son, we are also united to the whole Godhead. Praise the Lord. And this is marvellous because sometimes we just look at our salvation as though Jesus is involved and nobody else. As though we are saved by Jesus. Or maybe we even go as far to say we're united and one with Jesus Christ. And he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. And that's true. But remember, hallelujah. That in the Son is the Spirit, and in the Son is the Father, <laughs> and, and they are a Godhead, praise the Lord. So to be in Christ means we also are united to the Trinity. Let's look at the Word of God together, praise the Lord. And we're looking today in the Bible reading section, we're looking at Colossians 3.3, 3, John 17 verses 21 to 22, and John 14, verse 17. So, let's just kind of give the overall picture here of, of what Christ has done for us. Hallelujah. Colossians 3, 3. It says this, I'm reading from the King James Version. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And again, notice that term, with Christ. That's a positional truth term, in Christ, in whom, in him, with Christ, in, by, with is the Greek terminology. And this is a, a kind of a positional truth word that we have as believers. And it says, for you are dead, your life is hid with Christ <coughs> in God excuse me, in God. And so that's a powerful truth because it's talking about being with Christ, in Christ, and our life is hid with Christ, but then it says in God. And that word in God is the Trinity. It's the triune God. It's the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so our life in Christ is hid, concealed, secure, not just in Christ, but in 
God, in the Godhead, in the Father, in the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. And that's where our life is. Our life is in Christ, in the Father, and in the Son. It's hid and secure, folks. So don't tell me that you can lose it. Don't tell me this devil can steal it. Don't tell me you're unsecure. Look, the reality is that you and your life, your eternal life, your spiritual life is hidden in the very Godhead. Praise the Lord. That's where your salvation stems from, from the Godhead. They took the decision together as the Godhead, you know, to make the decision to save you, to redeem you, to pay the price for you. And that's what we've got to understand, that even when Christ was on the cross, the Bible says that God was reconciling, the Godhead was reconciling the world unto himself, hallelujah, by Jesus Christ on the cross. And so that's the reality. Jesus physically hung on that cross, praise the Lord. But the Godhead was involved in reconciling man through Jesus hanging on the cross. And so you're, the whole Godhead has been involved in the salvation and the redemptive plan of salvation through Christ. And that's something that we should be thankful for. That's something that we should uplift and glorify God for. Hallelujah. So now, what I want you to understand is, although we're in Christ, we're also in the very Godhead. And our life is hid there. Praise the Lord. So what does it mean to hide? What does it mean to hide? It means to conceal that it may not become known. And so what does that mean? And I think I've spoken on this verse before in some of the other lessons. But the reality is the world looks at us. They just see us as human beings. They just see you as a human being. They just see our outward image. They don't see that the very life of God dwells in us and we dwell in God. Our life source is not biological. I'll say that again. Our life source as a Christian is not biological. It is spiritual. It is the very life of God. And it's concealed in the Godhead. It's secure in the Godhead. Yes, we are biological by birth. But our spiritual nature now has been changed. And our spiritual life is that of the Godhead who indwell us and who we indwell, praise the Lord, because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what Colossians 3 is truly saying, you see, because of Jesus Christ, we are now in the Godhead. Our very life is connected to the Godhead. And so that's what should encourage you as believers to know that your Father in heaven is your dad. And the Spirit of God, who is God the Holy Spirit, indwells you. And Christ is in you. And you see how, how reciprocated the Godhead is. Now, the Godhead and the Trinity, of course, is a, a big subject in itself. But the reality of what the Scriptures teach is one God, yes, but, re, but he is revealed as one God in three distinct persons. I'll say that again. Three distinct persons. One life, but three distinct persons. And one essence, as it's called in theology terms. One essence, one life, one God, yet three distinct persons. And sometimes we try and get our head around that, but we've just got to believe that. We've just got to understand that that's what the scriptures teach. Hallelujah. And, and, and that's the reality. It's not free manifestations. And I know in terms of a lot of Christendom today, that's creeping into a lot of preaching. It's not free manifestations. It's free distinct persons. I'll say it again. Three distinct persons persons yet one God and we must understand the truth of what the scriptures say 
So God the Father is in heaven. At his right hand is God the Son. And the Holy Spirit has been sent to this earth, hasn't he? And of course they are one God, but three distinct persons. And we must understand that because also we've got to understand the Holy Spirit is also God. You know, we kind of limit sometimes the Holy Spirit to being some force or cloud or power or fire or water or oil, anointing. No, he's a person. He's a distinct person of the Godhead. It's God, the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And as we go through this lesson today, you will understand how the whole Trinity is involved in your salvation and you are united with the Trinity itself. Praise the Lord. So you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When did we die? When did this deadness take place? At the crucifixion of Christ. We were crucified with Christ. Hallelujah. That's when we died. When Christ died, we died. When Christ rose, we rose. And so we have been risen with Christ. And now we have the resurrection life of Christ dwelling in us. And that life is hid, concealed in the Godhead. So people around us cannot see it. People around us can't perceive it. People around us don't understand the fullness of it. You know, it's treasure in earthen vessels, as it were. So on the outward, we look the same, but on the inward, we are completely different. Praise the Lord. So we're in God, the Godhead, the Trinity. That's what the Bible says we are in. So when we talk about positional truth and we say in Christ, we also must say in God, in the Godhead, because that's a positional truth word. Hallelujah. And so we are a dead people, but now we are alive in the Trinity of God. Praise the Lord. What about John 17, verse 21 and 22? We see that Jesus here praying and talking to the Father concerning those who would believe through the disciples' words. So he's talking about the disciples. He's also talking about those who would believe the gospel, who would believe because of the disciples' word. And we're now over 2,000 years on. And, um, and this is what Jesus said to the Father. He says that they all may be one, as you, Father, and, and are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Praise the Lord. That the world may believe that you have sent me, and that the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Now notice, number one, of course, that Jesus... The second person of the Trinity is also one with the Father. He is in the Father and the Father is in him. But notice what he says. He says that they also may be one in us. Plural word, in us. They may be one in us. And so again, you're not just in Jesus, you're in the Father. You're in the Trinity, praise the Lord. And that's key. Now, because we see a lot of the time oneness as an outward thing, don't we? We talk about the unity of the church. We talk about unity of denominations. We talk about unity of governments. We see a lot of the time unity based on outward circumstances. And the problem with that is, is that we also see our oneness with the Trinity, our oneness with the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, as an out, we define it outwardly. So, what do I mean by that? If we haven't prayed that much this week, we think we're not as close or as unified with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's a mistake because what you are doing is you're saying that your oneness is dependent on outward circumstances. And I really want to encourage you today that your oneness with the Trinity. 
with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is not dependent on outward circumstances. It's not dependent on whether you feel like you've prayed this week and got really close to God. It's wonderful when we pray. It's wonderful when we feel the presence of the Lord. But it's also wonderful when we don't feel the presence of the Lord because our oneness, our unity with God and the Godhead is not dependent on the outward circumstances. It's not dependent on how well we feel we have done because a lot of the time it's based on feelings. It's not based on God's measurement. It's based on our own measurement. And the problem is, of course, if we measure ourselves by each other, oh, it becomes basically like a, a spiritual competition in church, doesn't it? And even churches can be competing against one another. And we're not to compete. We are one with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So Christ prayed and says, let them be one as we are one, and that they may be one in us. Hallelujah. In the positional truth again. We are in Christ. We are in the Father. And as we're going to find out, we are also in the Spirit. And they dwell in us. Hallelujah. And that's key, folks. So when we're talking about unity of church, we've got to understand that our unity is already been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. He's the access to the Trinity. Jesus said himself, didn't he? No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus, as it were, when we believe on Jesus, he's like the doorway. He's the way to the Father. He's the way we also receive the Spirit who dwells in us. Our unitedness with the Father is because of Christ. Our unitedness with the Spirit is because of Christ. Christ is the way. He is the door. You see now? You see what Christ has done? Hallelujah on that cross. He has reconciled us both to God as in the Godhead. He is the way. He is the door. He is the truth. And by him we have access to the Father and access to the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. That's what Christ has done for you. Praise the Lord. And he is in He's caused you to be in united with the whole Godhead. Praise the Lord. So our oneness is a fact. Our unity with the Trinity and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is a fact, folks. Jesus said this. Jesus prayed this in John 17. And it's come to pass. Now he's died and rose again. And as we believe, that's what happens. We're united with the Godhead. And we dwell in them and they dwell in us, in Christ Jesus. And that's key, folks. Hallelujah. So he kind of adds a bigger role than we can ever imagine of the Godhead in your salvation. And we should give thanks for it. But also, it should make us secure because our eternal life is concealed in them. It's in them. It's in the Godhead. Hallelujah. And that's why it cannot be taken from you. Once you are truly, and I say this word, truly born again, believer. Praise the Lord. Let's have a look at John 14. John 14, verse 17. It says this, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not. Now, I'll just stop there just for a moment. Notice what it says about the Holy Spirit now. The Holy Spirit is referred to as him. This is a person, the third person of the Trinity. Now, when we talk about the Trinity, the first, second and third person of the Trinity, this is not a kind of a ranking order. No, it's not a ranking order. It's not like the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is somewhere lower. No, they are the Godhead, united, one God in three distinct persons, but they are also co-equal, the scripture says. They are co-equal in existence. And so when we talk about the Holy Spirit being the third person of the Trinity, it's not that he's lesser than the Father or lesser than the Son. They are co-equal, distinct in persons, 
in a Godhead, yet one. And that's what we must understand. And I'm trying to get this truth out because there's many lies out there. But we must understand that it's referred to, Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as him. It's a person. So it's not a force. And unfortunately, in the charismatic Pentecostal movements today, which I'm part of, which I am, I'm a charismatic, I'm a Pentecostal believer. You must understand, though, I... I, I do get hurt sometimes by the fact of why the Holy Spirit is portrayed as though he's a fire or as though he's a wind or though he's a, he's a river. Or, and these are all illustrations we can use to refer to the moving of the Holy Spirit. But we forget that Jesus referred to him as him. He's a person. He's the Godhead or part of the Godhead, praise the Lord. He's the first preferred person of the trinity and so jesus himself referred to him as him personality person hallelujah so the because it seeth him not neither knows him but you know him for he dwells with you now jesus here in context is talking to the disciples but you know him they had experienced the moving of the Holy Spirit. They had seen the Holy Spirit at work. You know, it, it's kind of like the disciples, it, when they said, show us the Father. And, and Jesus says, I, look, you've seen the Father. You know, <laughs> where? You know, because they had seen the works of the Father. They had seen the Father in Christ. They had seen the love of the Father. They had seen the compassion of the Father. They had seen the healing uh, or, or power of the Father, the love of the Father through Christ, through what, his actions, through and ultimately in the cross and the resurrection. And it's the same with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying, look, disciples, the world don't know him. The world can't see him. The world don't believe him. But you know him. You've seen him. You know him. You perceive him. Through me, you have seen the work of God, the Holy Spirit, in and through me, Jesus is saying to the disciples. But then what does he say? He say, for he dwells with you, but shall be in you, shall be in you. And so we are seeing clearly here, Jesus is saying, look, disciples you've seen him you've experienced him you've seen he's moving amongst you uh, and, and in front of your eyes through my life but now he's with you because i am with you you see see that's how united jesus is with the father and with the holy spirit he's saying you've seen the father but you've also seen the spirit because i am with you the holy spirit is with you but he shall future tense be in you now when did that happen at the day of pentecost the god the holy spirit came on the day of pentecost and he dwelt believers praise the lord he dwelt the disciples the apostles he dwelt all those who believed on christ and it's the same today he dwells us he is in us and the problem is sometimes we are looking for the wind or the, the rain of the Spirit, or the, this, that and the other, and we bring illustrations. And sometimes we need illustrations, don't we, to, to help our minds and our thinking. But the greater truth is that not only is Jesus in us, not only is the Father who is one with Jesus in us, but also the Holy Spirit who is in us because of Jesus. He indwells us as believers too. So I'm no longer looking up. And I want to encourage you to stop looking up as though the Holy Spirit is some rain or force or cloud. Start to understand that the Holy Spirit indwells you and you indwell the Spirit. That together, this is the terminology for unitedness unitedness hallelujah praise the lord he indwells you which means he's made his home in you he's made his residence 
in you. And the scripture says we are temples of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. Because Christ dwells in us and so does the Father. So he shall be in you. So that has happened. So we can no longer say that this is something that's going to happen. This has happened the moment we believe because Jesus has died and rose again. Hallelujah. What does it mean to dwell? It says that the Holy Spirit shall be in you. He dwells with you, but shall now he shall be in you. He's going to dwell in you. What does, what does this word mean? It means not to depart and continue to be present. I'll say that again. It means not to depart, but continue to be present. And when you follow this word all the way through and you see Paul encouraging believers that the Holy Spirit dwelt in them, or the other word is abides in them, we must understand that that's what happens. The Holy Spirit does not depart from us now. That's when Jesus says, Lo, I will be with you always. But who is with us? Who's dwelling in? The Holy Spirit as well. Jesus as well and the Father. They are with us always. The Holy Spirit dwells in us, folks. He dwells in you as believer. And he shall not depart. I'll say that again. He doesn't depart ever. At any moment, at any time. And that's, we get mixed up so, mu so much because this, I think it was the psalmist David who says, you know, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And, and we t I think it's even been made into a Christian song. And so we, we, we say, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. We pray prayers either in those words or in in similar words, we listen to sermons that say similar things. Take not the Holy Spirit from me. We think it's a place of humility. I'll say that again. We think it's a place of humility to say, take not the Holy Spirit from me. As though that's some kind of great prayer. Now, David prayed that prayer, I believe. But he wasn't born again. The Spirit hadn't yet come. Jesus has not yet died and rose again. But for a believer, it's different. A believer cannot pray. A believer cannot say, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. We cannot believe that the Holy Spirit departs because he dwells with us. And now because of Christ, he dwells in us. And the scriptures confirm this over and over and over again, folks. So the Holy Spirit does not depart from us. You might say, well, what about when I sin? Surely the Holy Spirit doesn't, it should depart from me then because he's holy. No, 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 no. Who do you think convicts you? Who do you think gets grieved when you sin? Who do you think talks to you? and says, don't do that again, or talks to you and say, look, this is a better way. It's the Holy Spirit that dwells in you, that you feel grieved. Hallelujah. It's the Holy Spirit who begins then to teach you to live a different way. Oh, oh, believers, understand he dwells in you. He shall not depart and he continues to be present. So even when you don't feel the Holy Spirit, he's present at all times. He's present at all times. And I just want you as believers to understand, not only is the Father your Father, not only are you in Christ, not only are you in the Father, but don't forget God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, because he now dwells in you too. Praise the Lord. Amen. So now let's just go just for a few moments to the explanation part of the notes. And it says this, now you are a Christian, the life that you live is not according to the old life or the biological life in you that you was born with. The life you have in Christ 
is the very life and nature of the Godhead. Praise the Lord. God's life is now yours. He lives in you and through you. Now, I just want to say at this point, just because anybody's listening, that, you know, I'm not preaching here little gods or the little God theology, folks. You know, because it's still his life. It's still God's life. It's not our own generated eternal life. It is his life. So this is not that we are all, all, all of a sudden co-equal with the Godhead as though we're little gods. Absolutely not. That's heresy, folks. Because it's still his life that has been granted to us by his grace. We, to be God, is, means you're self, you're so, it's self-life folks you know he's omnipresent he's i mean there's so many characteristics to the godhead he's self-existent he's known as the self-existent one we are not self-existent we rely on him giving us his life by his grace amen so when you go to work when you live with family when you socialize you are not doing these things through your own life expression, but through the Godhead life and expression. The very unity that we have with the Trinity is at the moment concealed and hidden. And what I mean by that, it's concealed to the unbeliever. It's concealed to the world. The world does not know what the church really is it sees it as an organization it sees it as a religious belief but one day it shall be revealed hallelujah and the whole creation is groaning for that time when the life the true sons of god and daughters of god will be revealed to the world the unveiling of our unity with the trinity will be at the return of christ for all the earth to see our union with the Trinity shows us that our relationship and fellowship with the Trinity cannot be disturbed or disrupted. So if you think because you ain't prayed this week, your union with the Trinity is disturbed, it's not. It's not disrupted. It's not dis disturbed at all. The Holy Spirit does not depart at all. As Christians, this union cannot be reliant on us. Because if it was, it would go. It would come, it would go. The Holy Spirit would leave and come, leave and come, leave and come, wouldn't he? The Father would, oh my word, the Father would leave and turn his back and leave and turn his back and come back again. If it was reliant on us, but it's not, folks. Our unitedness, our oneness, our union with the Godhead is not dependent on us. Hallelujah. It's not reliant on our lives, but his life. This means our union is secure and protected. The Christians' lives are not separated into divisional parts for his one. What does that mean? Again, that's another word for that oneness. It, you know, we are different in our diversity, of course, of, of why we do church, the way we uh, think of church, but we are truly one with the Godhead. Hallelujah. So we're not separated into divisional parts, but are one. That's what Jesus prayed. That's what Jesus said. Like God is one. We do not have spiritual parts and natural parts. And again, I hear this a lot. We're not spiritual part and natural part. We've got to understand when the Bible talks about natural, it's talking about temporal, that which is temporary. And a lot of things in life are temporary until God makes it anew. But it's spiritual all the same. Hallelujah. Our lives are all spiritual because it's who God is. God is spirit. And it's his life in us. So even our body we call natural. No, it's temporal. It's temporary. But even the first man, Adam, who had a created body, folks, he was made by God in God's image. And so there's nothing natural about this body. There's nothing natural about planets. 
and the, and the solar system. It was all created by God. It came out of God, but it's temporary. It's temporary. God will make a new heavens and new earth. God will give us, grant us new bodies. Hallelujah. It's temporary, and we call it natural, but it's natural in the sense of temporary. But all of it was designed by God. All of it has been generated, created supernaturally by God. Hallelujah. So now let's just turn to the other scriptures section. And we're going to see again how powerful our oneness, our uni unity with the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit really is because of Christ Jesus and because we're in Christ. John 10, 30, it says this, hallelujah, I and my Father are one, Jesus said. I and my Father are one. Now, when people saw Jesus, they were seeing that his unity with the Father. But they didn't see, well, Jesus there, the Father next to him, then the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said, I and my Father are one. So what am I saying here? Just because you don't see, you know, Jesus here and the Father on the other side and the Holy Spirit on your head, it doesn't mean that you're not one with them. Again, don't look through your natural sight because if they, because they look through their natural sight, a lot of them mocked Jesus when he said this, I and my Father are one. They didn't, well, where is he then? Where is the Father then? Where is the Spirit then? You see. And so a lot of the times we get into that trap. You might be in that trap right now. That you think, well, I can't see. I cannot see how I'm in union with the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. Because all I see when I look in the mirror is me. Oh, folks, it's concealed in this body awaiting to be displayed at the resurrection praise the lord and so don't be fooled by what you see in the mirror understand you are one with the trinity he dwells in you the godhead are at work in your life praise the lord because of christ jesus just like jesus said i and my father are one notice there's no buts there's no ifs Jesus said, we are one. Praise the Lord. The Trinity, therefore, is unified. Not three gods, no. Neither three manifestations, no. But one God, three co-equal persons, distinct persons, yet one. That's the all-encompassingness of the Trinity. Romans 12, 4 and 5. For as we have many members in one body, all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body, we're in Christ, and every one members, members of one another. So this one body now is Christ's body. And so we are one in Christ in his body but many members. And so just because we are many members, just because we are distinct in our personality, distinct, we share one life, it's the life of God. As unity goes in the church, we share one life. Our unity even amongst denominations is not based on putting on conferences or putting on unity prayer meetings they're all nice, they're all good, and we can try and get along as best as we can. But our unity must always be focused on Jesus Christ because we are one body, different offices, different gifts, diversifying in all areas, but yet one, praise the Lord. And he says we are members one of another. So because we are one with the Godhead and because the Godhead and Christ is one with himself, with his own body, praise the Lord. And we are members of that body, it means we are one. It's the same life as brothers and sisters in Christ. We can be different around the world, yet because we share the life of God, we are one together. Praise the Lord. One family, one body, 
one church. Praise the Lord. Amen. So diversity does not mean separation. Our oneness is in the Godhead in Christ. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17 says, But he that is joined to the Lord is one, that word one again, one spirit. Praise the Lord. That's key, folks. Now, this is in a context where some of the believers within the Corinthian church was having sexual relations with prostitutes, orgies, and things like that. They were sinning. And Paul's writing to say, look, no, you, you, you shouldn't have sexual relations and join your physical body, as it were, to the prostitutes in the temples uh, in the, to other gods. No, 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 no. If it, uh, no, 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 Corinthian church. No, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So there is a relation, a picture, as it were, between being one physically and one spiritually. And we are one spiritually with the Lord. One spirit because we have his life dwelling in us. Praise the Lord. But it does give us an understanding of, of this understanding of oneness. Because, to, you know, it's like when the Bible says married couples... They have sexual relations and they are one flesh. Notice, one flesh. Not one spirit, one flesh. But in Christ, as the bride of Christ, we are, we are one spirit. So there is a difference, but there is a picture. Because that word oneness, in terms of this context, is one of glued together, cemented together. Hallelujah. And so, and having union together. So there's the union physically, but then there's the union spiritually. And we are united with Christ. We are cemented together with Christ. We are glued together. We are glued together in our spirit, as it were. Hallelujah. And it's a supernatural glue. It doesn't unstick. There's no glue remover. In the spirit realm, folks. Hallelujah. And that's why marriage was to, supposed to be the picture, a revelation, as it were, of the true spiritual unity we have in Christ with the Godhead. So be he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So our oneness is with the Godhead. Joined means we are glued and cemented and our spirit is is united to his spirit praise the lord hallelujah and so we are one with the lord now we are one with him praise the lord now 1 corinthians 12 then goes on to say in verse 13 it says for by one spirit that one spirit by one spirit we are all baptized into one body so we are one body with christ but now that has come about by one spirit who is the Spirit? Who has baptised us into the one body of Christ? It is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit it's talking about here. For by one Spirit we are baptised into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made all to drink into one Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit now. One spirit has baptized us into the one body of Christ. One spirit is we have drunk from. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. So our oneness, first of all, with Christ and the Godhead is not dependent on status. Our oneness with one another is not dependent on creed or color or status. But we are united to Christ by the fact that we are members of his body because of our union with the Spirit now. The union we have with the Spirit, it's by one Spirit, by one Spirit we have drunk. 
We have received. That's what it means to drink. To receive inwardly, we have received the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. At the point we was born again, we received the Spirit. We received Christ. We received the Father. Hallelujah. It's been done by the work and the power of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Amen. And Galatians 3.20 says, Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. So this Godhead, the Godhead is one. So to receive the Father, we have to receive the Son. To receive the Son, we have to receive the Father. To receive God the Father and God the Son, we receive the Holy Spirit. Because they are one. The Godhead is one. So we receive them as one. And we're in them as one. And they are in us as one. Praise the Lord. For God is one. Amen. So God is unified. He's unified before us. He is unified now in us. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 4 verse 6 says, One God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. So again, this is confirming that there's one God, one Father, who is above all, through all, and now in you all. That's positional truth. In you all. So this is saying, look, the one God, the one Father, so it's, dis it's really bringing out the Father now, the first person of the Trinity, is in you. So we've understood Christ is in us. We've understood now the Holy Spirit. We have drunk. He is in us. And now this verse says the Father is in us as well. Praise the Lord. So we are unified with the Father. He's in us. 1 John 3, 24 says, And he that keeps his commandments, he dwelleth in him, and he in him. So now it's saying, we, if we keep the commandments, we are in him, and he is in us. And here, hereby we know that he abides, he's made his home, that's what abide means, he's made his residence in us, by the Spirit which He has given us. So now it's talking again about the Holy Spirit, that we know we are indwelling God, and that He is indwelling us by the Spirit He has given us, by the Holy Spirit, folks. Hallelujah. So what am I trying to say? All these scriptures, some of them relate to Christ. Some of them relate to the Father. Some of them relate to the Holy Spirit. But they all say the same thing. That God is one and they indwell us and we indwell them. Hallelujah. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. So Jesus abides and has made his home in us. This abiding is by the Spirit. The commandments, now this is where everybody gets confused, so hear me really loud at this moment. The commandments referred to here is what John has been going on about throughout the whole book. And if you read it, you will see the commandment is to believe on Jesus Christ and to love one another. That is the commandments he's talking about. He's talking about not the Ten Commandments or the Law Commandments. He's talking about the commandment to believe on Jesus Christ. This comes out even more clearly in the final scripture now, 1 John 4, 15. It says, Whoso shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. How much clearer then can you uh, have the verse of scripture? Folks, if you believe on Jesus Christ as the Son of God, if you've received Jesus as your Saviour, this scripture clearly says that God, the Godhead, that's what it's referring to, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, God, the Godhead, dwells in him, the person who's believed on Christ, and he, the person who's believed in Christ, in the Godhead. 
That scripture sums it all up. Because of Jesus, whom we have believed, we are in the Godhead, and the Godhead dwell and are there forever. They will not depart from us ever. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The way of the Godhead dwelling in us is through us believing on Jesus Christ as Saviour. Amen. So, apply section. Begin to recognise that your life is his life and his is now yours. There is no separation between you and the Godhead. Remember that last verse I just read to you. This union will be revealed at the resurrection. Praise the Lord. You dwell in the Godhead and the Godhead dwells in you. Amen. I'm just overwhelmed by how great our Saviour is, how great our God is. Praise the Lord. So, questions. Why do you think Christians see their lives as separate from the Trinity? Question two. Why do you think it's important for Christians to know that they are secure in the Trinity? And the final question, question three, how can we live this unity with the Trinity out in our lives as Christians? So I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. I hope it's illuminated to you how true that it is that you dwell in the Trinity and the Trinity dwells in you. Until next time on Just Jesus, God bless you.